Neil, uh, welcome and thank you for coming along to talk to us about uh, uh, modern times in the world of, world of FE and skills. Mm. Um, these, uh, this series of In Conversation, organised by Fertile, is really in line with our mission to develop the leadership of thinking in the sector so that we can sure. do better in the future. And uh, in particular today, we're looking at the changing landscape of FE and skills. Um, and I know from your experiences, uh, and we, we can go into this later, but your experiences of being in the sector, leading the sector and moving on from leading an organisation to leading thinking and projects that I think help us along, is to hear from you, uh, you know, what your opinions are, what you think needs to be done. Mm. So um, help us, help the sector be uh, critical, be, be, be more thoughtful really as we, as we go forward. So uh, this, this changing landscape, um, actually yes. it's quite enormous uh, in, in its many forms. And I wondered what you made of it, you know, from your different mm. roles, from having been principal chief exec of a training organisation and now, you know, as I say, consulting in the, in the sector. Mm. So the, la the skills, it's, it's okay. a big change. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you to Fessel um, for giving the opportunity. And I think these sorts of opportunities to people who've been in leadership positions yeah. to reflect on uh, the sector um, are very valuable and they're also quite rare because uh, our sector is, as, is, as you describe it, very uh, hot with change yeah. and developments and our leaders are uh, very much preoccupied with mm. uh, the running of their organisations and the uh, being able to t try and react and shape their organisations to cope with the future. So uh, a great opportunity to, to, to maybe okay. pause for breath. Um, and you're right, the, these are big changes mm. uh, within the sector. Um, I have to say they're not new. One of the things that characterises the FE and skills sector is the ability to adapt and to change uh, as government policy changes, as the world changes in terms of technology mm. and so mm. on. So I'm interested in the reforms this time because they focus very much on reforms to technical vocational education um, and I've spent uh, almost my entire career focused on technical education uh, and vocational education and by that I mean um, education that equips both young people and adults with the skills that they need to be able to build a future, um, to get employment, to earn uh, decent wages, but also the contribution that uh, is made to businesses through having great people sure. who uh, can add value to businesses. And my sadness is that we are in a position where our skill system is not performing as well mm -hmm. as other skill systems in other countries. Um, that's played out in terms of productivity, 20% better productivity in France and in Germany, 30% uh, better productivity in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's not all explained by skills, um, but a big chunk of it is the, uh, the, the problem with the workforce not having the skills uh, that they need and businesses need uh, in order to be more competitive in what is now a very much global economy. Yeah. So I come at this from the perspective of the individual and the importance of skills on them, but also from the perspective of uh, businesses, industry uh, and of the country mm. in terms of um, how we can make a better future for everybody uh, in that, our country. That's interesting, I think, because that's where you and I absolutely touch hearts. Mm. Um, my original interest uh, was um, I wanted uh, uh, young people in particular to train to do a job because yeah. with learning to do a job comes a chance to be a new self. Mm. So I came at it very much from mm. the, the, the point of view of an individual. Mm. Um, people let, train them to get a job, they can then have some money in their pockets and feel yeah. good about themselves. Yeah. And of course that then takes you through the door, it took me through the door to where you come from, yeah. which is actually is about uh, the community, you know, the kind of employment community and going on into to how important mm. skills are in the nation. Mm. And I'm interested, in, same for learners, and how people come into the world of FE and skills through different doorways. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about your background and how, uh, how, how did you start to love this quite so much? It's interesting because I, in a way I'm a product of uh, a kind of education system that um, 
very early on makes judgments about whether people are yes. going to be academically successful or not. Mm -hmm. So I was born in the West Country, uh, went to a local village school. Um, and in fact, my mother taught at the school Ooh. that uh, <laughs> I attended, which was problematic in itself. But Good boy. Um, yeah. by the age of 13, we actually moved because my father left the Navy and got a job uh, as a social worker. Uh, slightly bizarrely, but mm. um, and we moved to Essex, uh, mm -hmm. and I went to a much bigger school. When I was in the West Country, I was not interested in academic education. In fact, okay. they had a setting system oh. uh, with the high ability students in set one and uh, those with learning difficulties in set five. Mm. Uh, and I was actually in set five, not mm -hmm. because I had learning disabilities, other than I wasn't interested in learning, um, which is, I guess, a, a disability. When we moved to the west, uh, from the West Country, my parents went to the local school, um, and these were in the days before the sharing of information. Oh, yes. yes. Um, and said that myself and my sister, as a twin, uh, are academically very able. Uh, and we were put in the highest sets in the school okay. um, and I ended up with uh, a hat full of GCSEs, went on and did A-levels. Um, but I didn't go to university, no. I decided I wanted to go to employment. But what that told me was, was actually we decide on where people are going to end up very early on um, and we have a embedded snobbery in this country about technical education as opposed to academic education. Uh, and we create a binary choice which says you are academic or you're mm. technical, vocational. Uh, the implication being if you're bright you do a academic mm. and if you're not uh, you do a vocational. And of course that's a nonsense because mm. actually all routes need both. And much of the learning that goes on in university is actually vocational um, and a lot of the learning which takes place in further education is academic. Yeah. Um, I think I've said before, I've got two sons, one, the oldest one, uh, went the traditional route of uh, A-level, went to university, studied as a civil engineer. Um, the younger one went the same route because the school insisted that he do A-levels. Uh -huh. um, he didn't want to go to university. He gave up his A-levels because he couldn't uh, engage with it. Um, and he came on an apprenticeship with yeah. our college. Uh -huh. um, and he's now an avionics uh, engineer, um, uh, earning as much as the, the older one. Mm. Um, and, and he went a vocational route, and so did my older son. You, talk, um, you talked about the snobbery. Is that still the case, do you think? That, you know, uh, it's, it's a wee while since you were at school. <coughs> but is it still I, quite I, so positive? I, th I think it is. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very... Uh, embedded concept mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think it plays out in terms of people's uh, choices, their, the advice they're given um, uh, uh, about the way in which we apportion status to people with different uh, qualifications. So if you've got a degree mm -hmm. um, then I think there's a perception which is quite different if you've got a higher level technical qualification. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this, that is problematic and it is a, it's a sort of British problem really um, that's got to be addressed as part of this, this reform package. Is that what the school system is trying to fix at the moment? Because it seems to me it's a, v a big agenda for the FE in school system. So what, what are they trying to fix? It seems to me that the, the central uh, drive is to try and create a, uh, a choice, a route, mm -hmm. um, which is as clear, as understandable, and as accessible as the higher education route. Okay. So that um, because it's very straightforward if you're going to go the university route. You, know, you do your GCSEs, you do your A-levels, you go to university. It's a whole lot more complex mm. uh, if you choose to go the technical route. Um, much more hard to, to navigate it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was um, true when you, uh, after your A-levels, when you thought you didn't want to go to university. In, indeed, indeed okay. it was. Um, the other driver for me, uh, personally, is, is uh, a sense that, you know, I saw a statistic the other day that, you know, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. 
one in four children live in poverty, and, and it's still the case that if you uh, go to, to a local school, um, the circumstances of the birth of your parents mm. is the greatest determinant of your educational outcome. And that can't be right in a modern society that the die is cast from such mm. a young age. Sure. Um, and so part of what I've wanted to do in my career is not just about um, developing excellent vocational opportunities um, just, just for the sake of it, but, but actually to try and use high quality technical education as a ladder for, for young people mm. uh, to be successful, to progress, and also to have a sense of achievement and status, mm. which is associated with, with whatever choices they make. Mm. I, I tell a story about um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, coming out of the car park at the college uh, and there was a young lad uh, putting his motorbike gear on, but he hadn't put his helmet on, he was on the phone. And I knew that he'd come along for some interviews for an apprenticeship with Eurostar. Mm -hmm. um, really good apprenticeships, uh, high quality apprenticeships, well paid. Um, and there were about 60 shortlisted for 10 Oof. places. So I was looking at it, the, the lad as I was crossing the car park thinking, oh, I'm not really sure whether I'm going to ask him how he got on because <laughs> he's got a six to one chance that... Yeah, uh, it's tough. Uh, but I decided I would. Um, and I, and I realised when I got closer to him that he was actually in tears and he'd been talking to his mum um, and he had got one of these apprenticeships. Oh. Uh, and he said, you know, this is going to change my life. Mm. Um, he said, right, I, right. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, I, I lost my way, mm -hmm. um, and this is going to give me something fantastic for the future. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the power of yeah. really good technical education. That's what I was going to say, I mean, is that what's going on now, the reforms of today, do they do more of what helped that young man? Well, we, there, are, there are what I would call green shoots in relation okay. to um, the skill system. But let me tell you what I think the problems are okay, first, please. and then we'll move on to <laughs> maybe Good news. some of the solutions. But um, I think um, our skill system is uh, too low level, and it's too focused on uh, volumes uh, of learners. So we have a, if you take apprenticeships for example, we have a target of three million apprenticeships, um, and that is the focus of most of the effort in terms of policy development. But in fact, if you look at apprenticeships, most apprenticeships in the UK are for older people, mm -hmm. um, over the age of 19, over the age of 24. Only a third of apprenticeships are, are being taken by 16 to 19 year olds. Um, therefore, they are for people who are already in employment, uh, rather than at the start of their career. And most of the provision is at level two. Um, now, in my experience, uh, a level two qualification is very useful, but it is the stepping stone towards what I would uh -huh. describe as mastery or skill. Um, uh, and uh, the problem and the consequence of two thirds of our apprenticeship provision being for older people who are already in work at relatively low levels is that we're not going to create the pipeline of engineers, technicians, craftspeople, skilled people, computer scientists, uh, that the UK needs. Mm -hmm. um, because we need to establish that pipeline uh, from 16, from 18, mm. uh, to have those people coming through into businesses, uh, particularly with the changing demographic. I mean, most uh, businesses, if you look at the engineering sector, the advanced manufacturing sector, they have a real problem with an aging workforce um, in the next 10 years. Mm. Many of the people that uh, are going to uh, have contributed to that business in terms of their expertise and experience are going to retire. The impact of Brexit is going to sit on top of that. Um, and unless we start developing the next generation of skilled people and have a skill system that's geared up to do that, we are going to pay a heavy price, I think, mm. post-Brexit particularly. So in, in the past, we've had these, these, this changing system stuff. 
And I'm, I'm wondering what went wrong then. Yeah. But we're, just, we're still talking, but you and I have talked before about these kind of difficulties. Mm. There are no ladders down to bring young yeah. uns into the, to the yeah. training programme that are strong enough. So what's gone wrong this time since the last reform? I, th I, think, I think part of it is, um, comes back to this embedded snobbery that, that we have undervalued underinvested okay. and underdeveloped technical vocational education in the UK. We've been very concerned with the 50%. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen university participation go up from uh, about 5% in 1965 to 48-49% now. Yeah. Um, but we haven't given the same attention to the other 50% in terms of where their futures lie. Our, our approach has been has lacked a skill strategy, it lacked a national program that says there is these serious issues um, and we need to uh, do something to at a national scale in order to address it. Let me give you a, a, a couple of examples. I mean if you go back to the 1990s and what I describe as the marketization of the skill system, yeah. um, uh, colleges got, became incorporated free from local authority control, and I'm not saying that's a, uh, a bad thing or a good thing, but they were given autonomy from uh, local authority control. Um, they determined their own curriculums, uh, and what, what we ended up with was a curriculum offer within further education colleges that was heavily supply-based. Supply Yep. So it was based on what young people and individuals wanted to study mm -hmm. um, and colleges wanted to offer rather than necessarily in alignment with what the business world. needed and what, where you might yeah. be in there. We then said to colleges, we're going to introduce a funding system which values above all else full-time students and other values above all else qualification outcomes. Mm. We're not too interested in what the qualification outcomes are in, um, but that's what we're going to value. And the result was a huge increase in full-time students in college. Because they paid more? They, they paid more, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it's easier to deliver than part-time flexible programs. So we saw a huge increase in participation, which is great. Mm. The, the same thing happened in universities. So we lost our 35 polytechnics who became universities. And again, we attached a value to full-time honours degrees uh, which meant that participation in higher education also increased significantly. So what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it in terms of um, more people participating in education uh, and learning. My question is what, what type of education and learning mm -hmm. and does it link sufficiently to the outcomes mm -hmm. Um, I remember the debate around that time, though, um, you know, um, education being asked to cure the problems of the yeah, economy. Yeah. And there's always been a missing partner around the table. That may not be true now. Mm. And the missing partner was employers. Mm. So, you know, we'll, do, we'll work very hard in colleges to get yeah. people ready for yeah. work. Not oven ready, but ready to, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to, to start. Um, and um, employers were then absent. Now it's changed since those reforms mm. in the 90s mm. and employers now are, uh, I think the phrase is in the driving seat. Mm. Is that, are you hopeful about that? Are you hopeful that will make a difference? Yes, I mean the, 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 the history of um, education and skills policy is, is one of um, intimately either governments trying to yeah. uh, run the system uh, or uh, a more laissez-faire approach where employers run the system. I mean, if you, my own organisation was formed out of the 1964 Industrial Training Act. Mm, yeah. The 1964 Industrial Training Act was uh, put in place because of concerns about the sufficiency and adequacy of technical mm. education. Mm. Um, it resulted in the establishment of the industrial training boards for yeah. each of the sectors, and um, it also introduced the, the levy. Um, and here we are, 50 years I later, <laughs> reintroducing yeah. the levy. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting about the 64 Act and the consequences of it was that there was no state funding. Um, yes, I remember. Uh, yeah. the, the funding for skills came through employers in the shape of a levy. Mm. Um, and you know, one of the things that's not in the reforms, uh, the technical reforms that currently got, is a reintroduction of the levy on a wider basis. Yeah. It's still just for larger employers. But I wonder whether or not 
um, there is a, a role for employers, mm -hmm. not just being in the driving seat, but actually having a responsibility to fund some of these yeah. developments yeah. Um, and having a responsibility as well. Uh, for example, if you're employing an apprentice, an apprentice mm -hmm. I'd like to see an apprentice charter that oh. p places minimum obligations on the employer mm. in terms of uh, the wage, mm. willingness to release the apprentice to go to college, um, and at the end of the apprenticeship to offer them employment. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that we should have higher expectations of employers um, as well as the expectations we have of mm. learners. I'm delighted that the Institute for Apprenticeships has started to define uh, what an apprenticeship actually is oh, and yeah. as importantly what it's not. Yes. I would go further than the Institute for Apprenticeships has gone um, in that I think we need to uh, much more clearly establish the brand of an apprenticeship um, and some people are not going to like what I've got to say, not that they will necessarily take any notice of it, but m my view is that as we move forward we're going to have to start making some difficult choices about who we support mm. in terms of funding um, and what type of provision we support as well. Uh, and my view would be that we have to prioritise apprenticeships for young people um, entering their first career employment rather than those who are older and already employed. Um, we should try and develop something which is much more reflective of the German system in the sense that you know the majority of young people uh, in Germany and Austria and, and, and the like um, start their apprenticeship at 16. Uh, by the age of 19 or 20 they're, they're yeah. a good way through it. Um, and that um, the apprenticeship should start with a level three qualification, not a level two. Okay. Um, my view is um, level two provision is absolutely critical because it's, sure. a, it's a platform from which young people can progress on to complete their apprenticeship. But we should call it something else. Yeah. Um, and we should focus it on preparing young people to be able to access those high quality, high level apprenticeships uh, that are needed by industry. And my experience of the jump from level two to level three is it's really quite a tough one. Yes. You know, people yes, think it's it just is. a simple progression step, but actually mm. that you could see that that's where, that's where trouble started for young yeah. people. It, it was yeah. harder than they thought it would be. Yeah. But um, much needed, I think, for, for the next la layer of learning, you know, the yes. next levels of learning. Yeah, ab absolutely. But and we have to we have to have a sense that um, uh, the apprenticeship is about mastery. It doesn't matter whether you're yeah, doing yeah. Uh, a retail apprenticeship mm. or, a, or a construction apprenticeship. Mm. It is about the mastery of all aspects mm. of uh, that particular mm. uh, role or, and, and industry. Um, and mastery doesn't come at level two. No, um, no, competence yeah. might in yeah. terms of job competence, but an actual mastery of a, uh, of a, of a trade comes mm -hmm. through um, not just completing the level three, but actually then the experience that comes after it. So I, one of the other things I would do is, is I'd a, a, give every graduating advanced apprenticeship uh, membership of their own professional body and actually give them the opportunity to do um, some work-based, uh, evidence-based uh, experience beyond the level three in order to, to, to acquire a professional status mm. within those institutes. Mm. We need to start oh, like giving um, a level of status and yeah. uh, to the people who've got what are amazing, mm. fantastic mm. skills. What else excites you about the current setup? Because the things you're suggesting seem very, very I mean, wonderful to me, quite warming. Yeah. Um, and it's got bits of the old system, and, but the new system has mm. um, well, these I, changes. I, I, I think there are, for me, there are three challenges within the technical reforms. Okay. Three, three areas that are going to have to be um, carefully looked at in terms of how, how we develop them. And they are... Um, people, infrastructure, and curriculum. Okay. So, if we start with infrastructure, um, I talked about the 1990s. We lost 
uh, in the 1990s, the entire skill centre network. Uh, I remember that, yeah. Out of the 64 Act came the establishment of 150 group training associations. We lost two thirds of those. Uh, there are about 30 left now. Um, we lost our polytechnics. Mm -hmm. um, and within the FE sector, we lost um, whole departments and faculties within colleges that were providing technical, uh, uh, technical subjects. So we lost <coughs> that infrastructure which would um, be able to continue to supply those skilled technical people. So we've got a rebuilding job to do. Mm. Um, the government is going some way with the introduction of the Institutes of Technology. Uh, its aspiration is to have uh, 15 uh, IOTs available across the UK, um, mainly focused on level four and level five, but with some level three provision. Mm. Uh, my view of that is it's a very good step, but it's a 140 million pound investment and it is not anywhere near enough to be able to replace the infrastructure that we've lost and the infrastructure that we need. Okay. So there needs to be a longer term investment program which ensures that, not that we've got pretty buildings, but that actually we've got world-class equipment and world-class learning environments in which people can learn the range of skills that are necessary. The second uh, is curriculum, and that's really about um, building a curriculum which is accessible by everybody, wherever they are in terms of their own development. So the learner that perhaps did not do well at school, but actually has got technical talents mm -hmm. and talents with their hands and who can progress through that, yeah. that uh, ladder. And also, you know, the very academic who actually want to blend technical and academic mm -hmm. uh, in the same way. So I think the future for FE is about not being just an FE institution that goes up to a certain level and then stops, but actually it's about uh, continuing education, it's about further education, it's about higher education. And we have to have a curriculum which is accessible, um, whether you want to be a full-time student, a part-time student while in work, um, wanting to study in the evening, and dare I say it, wanting to study in the weekend. So mm. there's a great challenge for the sector there to be much more responsive and flexible. Um, I mean, uh, I mean that, 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 that's, that's right to me. You know, I, I can see the picture you're painting. Um, when I was a principal, I was obsessed by two things, the lack of time for preparing for change. Mm -hmm. It happened and they expected the change to mm -hmm. be uh, at present in the world. And I think my real, uh, the, my real torment was about actually getting teachers, uh, trainers, lecturers, ready for the change so mm. that when the students walked mm. through the door we could handle it mm. and of course that that, that didn't happen mm. and you know we've had the situation where an FE uh, teachers at one stage you didn't have to be qualified as a teacher and then you didn't have to be qualified mm. and now you don't that kind of seesaw about actually the important role of professionals yeah. you know who do love their their, their trade uh, starting mm. with that and, and that still haunts me a bit. I mean, do, do the colleges and, and training play, uh, providers have the right equipment in place that really reflect the modern mm. world? And are the staff in any way being part of the modern world? Mm. So that when young people, uh, apprentices walk in, they know they're in the hands of people who know what they're talking about. Mm. FE institutions, and, and for that matter, independent learning providers, are, are tend to be very much responsive to yeah. policy directives. So government decides that this is the latest yeah. program or found, and then the, the organisations position themselves to uh, to meet that response. Because there's no funding from elsewhere. I mean, the government because there's no funding yeah. from elsewhere. So right. That's what you call think, Hobson's choice, isn't it? Well, I, I, I think two things. I think first of all, it would be great if sector leaders uh, were more engaged in not responding to policy, but actually helping to shape it. It would be really good if the politicians and the uh, government departments listened more to the sector mm. about what's needed mm -hmm. and about how uh, to approach. I mean, if you take T-levels, in many respects, that's an imposition of a, uh, an ideology 
um, onto the sector. So part of this, is, I think, is a responsibility on the part of leaders in the sector to find their voice and to mm. be clearer about mm. trying to shape policy uh, uh, at, at, at the centre of government. But I think the second part of it is that as organisations, we're going to have to move much more towards determining our own futures and our own strategy and our own vision rather than being told what that vision is. And I think there's, if you look at the FE sector, for example, and look at FE colleges, my college was the only college and first college to uh, become incorporated. We became incorporated as something very different because we wanted to be a specialist college of advanced technology. Um, and um, therefore, it's about creating diversity and it's about individual colleges deciding their own mission and vision for the future. In relation to their communities. In relation yeah. to their communities and in relation to their customers yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the broadest sense, um, rather than being completely dictated to in mm. terms of what they'll offer, who they'll offer it to, uh, and, and so on. So, so I think there's, there's something in that about um, us trying to take back the agenda, yeah. to drive yeah. the agenda, because you know, the, the experience, the expertise is, is in the sector. Um, uh, and perhaps we need to get better at being able to... And, you, and your passion, I mean, I've known, known you quite a while, and I, and I know how much you believe in the importance mm. of good vocational education mm. and training and progression and all the bits mm. that take people into different lives. Um, is there anything missing in the current reforms that you say that, that would make a difference? I mean, I'm on your side in believing yeah. that we need to be writing scripts for the future. Yeah. That's what Fettel lives for. Yeah. But actually, tell me, what you, you know, what would, what would you do if you ruled the world? What would you... Wow. Um, how would you change what's, yeah. what's going on now? Because yeah. I know you to be somebody who gets your sleeves up and helps things happen. Mm. What's missing? Gosh, it's, I mean, it's a big question. Mm. Um, you know, we, we have been here before, of course. We've, of course. We were here with, it was 14 years ago that we had the, um, the Leach Report, Sandy Leach Indeed. Report. Mm. 13 years ago that um, we had the Foster Report, mm -hmm. which actually talked about colleges being, vocational skills training being the mm -hmm. centre of their mission. Mm -hmm. um, if I can to just add to your list Helena Kennedy's learning works. Indeed. You know, I mean, you're yeah. right, been, we've had good people on our side yeah. doing great things, yeah. but But we haven't, we, we haven't fixed it yet. Um, I think there is an opportunity uh, for us to be much better, but I think it's going to take some tough choices. Um, so coming back to uh, some of the things I talked about earlier, I personally, and it's only a personal opinion, would... Um, would only have apprenticeships at level three and above. Uh, I would uh, look to create something much more comprehensive, much more effective to catch those young people who are furthest away from the employment market, not yet ready for apprenticeships, um, either because of the academic rigor of the apprenticeship uh -huh. or the, um, that they don't have the employability skills mm -hmm. that they're needed. And I'd like to see a really significant investment in uh, a program to take those young people to the point where they can access and sustain a higher level apprenticeship uh, at level three mm -hmm. or go on to a T level uh, at level three and then, and then beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so a genuine ladder rather than a huge gap in the ladder which very few, yes. um, and, and I'll tell you one of the reasons that that concerns me a lot. Um, I've seen, as I mean, I mean, at the college I was at, um, we had a very large number of apprenticeships with the rail industry, really top-notch apprenticeships with Atkins and um, uh, Talis and top, top global companies. And they were paying fantastic wages you would get it, they were supporting their apprenticeships through to level four um, and above. And that's absolutely fantastic. What we started to see at college open evenings were lots of young people in grammar school uniforms um, yeah. Yeah. coming through our doors. Mm. Great, fantastic that we're engaging with them. And middle class parents thinking, no debt, great career, 
great training, great employment. And my worry is that apprenticeships were uh, one of the ways in which you could support young people from disadvantaged backgrounds yes. and they could be successful and we might bring that ladder up, yes. which is why I think... The new exclusion. Yes. Mm, yeah. And I'm not arguing uh, against level two apprenticeships. I'm arguing uh, in, in itself, I'm arguing for a programme which takes people through level yeah. two and beyond. Um, I would, in order to pay for that, would restrict the uh, age entitlement for an apprenticeship to uh, no more than 24. Um, I wouldn't have uh, apprenticeships for people mm. in there. I think the oldest apprentice is 67 or something. Oh. Um, uh, I, I, I simply would call that something else because I think it is something else. And we need to do something else because they too, 24 year olds, this, this notion of retraining throughout our lives, maybe not do the apprenticeship, but the whole yeah. FE system has to take care of all the stages, not the ages, but the yes. stages of people's yes. learning. And yes, and I, I, one of the things that I think uh, would be interesting to explore is the idea of um, uh, a learning entitlement. Yep. So every school leaver has a learning entitlement, but they may not necessarily trigger that learning entitlement in the first three, four mm -hmm. years. They might go travelling, they might do anything, mm -hmm. um, and actually want to come back. Mm. Um, and the current system, or certainly the one where there was a difference in the funding between 16 to 18 year olds and 19 plus, worked completely against young people who decided later on because they were financially massively disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. um, my view would be they keep that credit mm -hmm. and they cash that credit when they want to crash that credit. Um, uh, and I also think there's a responsibility once people are in employment, um, you know, there is this question of when does the state stop taking responsibility and when does the individual and when does the employer take responsibility? Mm -hmm. um, I think the priority for any mature system is that the priority is young people starting a career in an industry because they become the next generation of technicians or engineers. Mm. We could talk forever could we, about <laughs> we what, could. what the world needs and I'm just, so this is already started, these, these reforms are they here have. and with us. And I'm just wondering how you're feeling about them so yeah. far. So yeah. I have a sense of, you know, you, you've told us the history and actually a kind of a trips into the future about mm. it. But mm. how confident are you? I mean, if, if you ruled the world, what's the, what's the big, okay. one big thing that you think would well, make a difference? Well, I, I think I started by saying there were three things that I think are absolute priorities. Yeah. Infrastructure, yeah. curriculum. The third one is people. Yeah. And I th what I mean by that is the workforce within the FE yeah. sector, whole of the sector. I think there is a major, major challenge um, to um, both professionalise uh, in terms of the status of FE teachers yep. um, <coughs> uh, and to um, support the workforce much more effectively than we do. I, mean, I was reflecting on this the other day and actually what are we asking uh, the average FE teacher to do. We're expecting that they have got really excellent pedagogical skills and they can teach groups of learners, they can teach individual learners, they can teach practical sessions, they can teach the theory, they can do the maths and English, um, they can teach learners with learning disabilities, they can teach level one, they can teach level two, three, four, maybe in the future. Wow. They have massive expectations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we want them to be fantastic training administrators so that they know what the uh, targets are and the progress of every individual mm -hmm. learner. We want them to be, to some extent, social workers and the, their ability to empathise and support learners uh, during difficult times. So we have huge expectations of uh, our teachers and trainers and we have some amazing people in the sector. Um, but do we really support them? Do yeah. we value them? in the way that mm. um, we need to, you know, the, the difference in salary between a FE lecturer, the, the average salary is £32,000 this year. In higher education, it's between forty five and 55000 um, So I think the only way we're going to get talented, experienced, industry expert people into our sector and staying in our sector is to give real status to the profession 
and to invest in our people in a way that we failed to do for mm. a number of years. And so my single biggest uh, message to government is, is to refocus, ask questions of the funding system, of the adequacy of funding, to enable uh, FE colleges mm. and leaders to, to, to nurture, reward uh, their people properly okay. because they will deliver the reforms that the government and the country most needs. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Um, Thank you. I have no argument with any of that. And I, I'm, re I'm remembering uh, when I was in colleges as, as a, a younger uh, professional, actually the people who came in to teach uh, the, the apprentices or the, the, the pre-apprentice levels were people who had been in colleges themselves and yeah. actually took great pride in coming back in from Absolutely. industry to be a teacher. So that mm. lovely um, circle, you know, mm. with, with the wraparound, with the expertise, knowledge and attitude, yeah. I think it is much missed. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I mean, just to, to say uh, that generally speaking, FETL is uh, running these explorations because, of course, they, they're key policy matters. But we're about scripts for the future, so we have, you know, we have no interest in, in, uh, in um, kind of training or teaching people in that. But I really share with you, and, and, and that's what FETL is about, is actually how do we support our professional colleagues in writing these scripts yeah. for the future. And if you check the FETL website, you'll see um, you know, some, some webinars and publications. We are there to feed the minds of our, of our, of our professional colleagues and others in the system to say, well, actually, just keep on learning yourselves and do it better yeah. the next time. So thank you for your contribution you. to that hope for the future. Thank you.